All right. The time has come. This is Jay Brown Yoga Talks Podcast. My name is Jay Brown. How are you? Are you an old friend? A new friend? Either way, thanks for choosing to listen. Muggs McConnell is here today, and I will tell you about that in just a bit. First, I'm just wondering how everyone's doing. Are you starting to go out again? I guess it depends on where you are, but seems like there's a slow emerging coming from out of the quarantine. I'm wondering if people are starting to teach classes again. I know a few centers have opened up, and I've just been really wondering what that's like. I have one friend Kel out there in the Gold Coast, shout out to you, Kel. And I know she reopened. And I asked her, did anybody show up? (laughs) And she said, yeah, actually. I mean, they had to limit class. They have all these safety protocols they have to employ, like a whole plan. But she said it was sold out. People came back. And we can debate whether that's a good idea, I guess, depending on where you are. But for me, I found it encouraging made me feel like, okay, maybe we are at some point going to come back together again. And I'm really looking forward to that. So I'm curious if you're out there and you started to teach classes again, I'm just, shoot me an email, tell me what it's been like. Are people coming? Are you wearing a mask? Are the outdoor classes? I guess a lot of times people are doing outdoor classes now. It is considered to be safer than indoor. I don't know. (laughs) My youngest daughter, she's five. She had her first play date yesterday since January. And we went strawberry picking and she, she wore a mask there. They were asking people to wear a mask, even though it was outside. But then she was with her friend. There was, we did kind of encourage them not to be like all over each other like they used to. But I mean... It was good. It was good for her to have a play date. And like everyone, I'm just really trying to figure out what the hell's going on. It's really hard to know. It just seems like there's almost a sort of schizophrenic or bipolar nature to the news that's coming at me and the initial fervor of the protest does seem to have calmed some. It's not that there isn't still people marching or events happening or again conversations happening i was talking about this last week certainly that's still happening but it it over time it doesn't have the same you know explosion of you know fires and police riot gear in riot gear you know there's certainly been kind of a a a leveling to it but it's still, right? It's still percolating. There's still all of it there. And then it's just so conflicting with the pandemic to know. Nobody really can tell us. And I have to say, as I, I talk about in today's conversation with Muggs, I am really relying on my yoga practice you know, just the simple act of it, even just on these online classes of coming together with people with this very specific intention, this ritual of bringing myself present to my breath, my body, and this immediate moment. It's like I, I need that rooting into what's actually occurring that I can observe right now. I can observe my breath happening. I can observe my heart beating. I can observe the feeling of my feet touching the floor. These are immediate realities. And when I put my attention there and I keep it there for a while, I experience life not as the anxiety of a news story. I'm not telling us not to pay attention to the news, though. We gotta 
try to keep our eyes open, <laughs> even though it's darn confusing. I will say, though, that there is a certain level of rawness and realness to my communications with people now, more than before, that's for sure. There's a whole lot less fiddling around on the surface bullshit and more like real conversations that I have with people. And that actually has led to a lot of wonderful exchange and connection, including today's talk with Muggs McConnell. Muggs wrote a book a few years ago called Letters from the Yoga Masters. And it came out right before a lot of the really big news of the guru scandals came out, you know, before a lot of the downfall that has happened since. And I had it in mind to talk to Muggs before the pandemic hit because I thought she might offer a perspective on gurus and maybe where things are going in terms of teacher-student relationships and even just provide some, some history for us. And so as I've been trying to return back to some of the ideas that I had in place before everything turned upside down, I reached out to Muggs and I'm super glad I did because she delivered on all of those things, on the history and on the perspective. So I was really happy to have had this conversation with her and I'm glad that you're going to get to hear it today. Real quick before we do, let me say something to any of you who are either currently running classes, even if they're online, or maybe you're looking to reopen your center, or maybe you're looking to start a new thing and you're getting together your systems. Do you have a studio management software that you already use? Are you using MindBody Online? Are you happy with it? Maybe now's the time to make a switch, or maybe you need to start from scratch with a company that can individualize to your situation. If so, I think you might check out today's sponsor, KarmaSoft. Longtime listeners have heard me talk about KarmaSoft for years. It's the studio management software that I used when I had a yoga center in Brooklyn. The owner, Rudy Sinekal, has been on this show before, and I encourage you to go back and listen to the episode. You can hear all about him and the company and why I think it's so great. Now might be the moment to really do a full reset, and Rudy and KarmaSoft can totally help you with that. I encourage you to check it out. Go to karmasoftonline.com. Also, this episode is brought to you in support from podcast premium subscribers Jessica Brown and Prabha Sinha. Thank you, Jessica and Prabha, and everyone who's choosing to become a podcast premium subscriber. We set up the podcast premium some while back as a way to give people an opportunity to not only get access to a full archive of the show, which is quite a resource, but also support us to help sustain the show instead of doing like a Patreon thing or a donation button. It's a choose your rate. And also, if you can't afford it right now and you wanted to listen to some of those episodes, you can email us and we'll give you a free membership. So if you are someone who's a listener of the show and you want to make a gesture of support, becoming a podcast premium subscriber is the best way to do that. You can learn more about becoming a podcast premium subscriber and find all the rest of my stuff at jbrownyoga.com. Okay, I think that's it. I don't think I've got anything else to say. I feel kind of all over the place. Just before doing this, I was thinking to myself, what happened this week? Should I, what should I talk about? And I just, <laughs> I don't know. It's a, it's a mishmash, isn't it? So we're just going to let it all lie where it is. And I will touch base with you on the other side, as I like to do. But for now, let's go ahead and get to this conversation that I had with Muggs McConnell. Hello? Are you there? 
I am. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Mugs. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing pretty good, all things considered. Yes. Yeah, interesting times we're in. I know, it really is. And I, I'm taking a lot of joy in having these conversations in the midst, in a sense, you know. It's uh, trying to reach out and connect to people from our little silos. and It's been good on some levels to try to process it all. Absolutely. Uh, there's, there's a lot of really good stuff coming <laughs> out of, um, well, you know, it's just, I guess, how life is. A big, a big shift makes a big shift. Yeah, and just so much, not that there isn't always uncertainty, it just seems we're very aware of how much uncertainty there really is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really, really feels that way. It's just, we do not know. <laughs> yeah, and where are you right now? I'm in southern Alberta, just above Montana, yep, near um, Glacier and Waterton Parks. I see. Mm-hmm. Open spaces. Yes, big sky. Yeah, yeah. That I just took a moment to imagine that in myself and the feeling of that. I have experienced it a few times in my life and immediately felt soothed. <laughs> yeah, so good, good. That's awesome. <laughs> well, it's a thing, you know. I I think certain places and geographic locations or even just types of geography, they have their own feeling to them. And so I have a little... I have traveled quite a bit over the last few years as I've had to. And I do a little thing where all the, every time I go to a new place, I take a moment to just sort of stop and I'll look around and then I'll close my eyes and just try to feel it Mm. and log it. And so big open spaces like that, like Montana and stuff or Wyoming, like that. And I was in the desert recently. I was in New Mexico too. It had that same wide open feeling, which, I don't, you know, living in the New York City most of my adult life, no, no, I cherish it. Yes, absolutely. Those, I don't know, there's something about that and and the areas that you mentioned as well. There's a real sacredness about them. There's a real energy of um, respect and appreciation from centuries and centuries. So, yeah. Yeah, well... Mugs, I love saying your name, Mugs. I'm so glad you said I could call you that. And I'm just sort of curious, where does it come from? When did you start being called Mugs? <laughs> yes. Um, well, when I was younger, my dad had nicknames for us all. And mine was Muggins because I really liked being hugged. <laughs> uh. And, and um, then in my uh, young adult years, my sister and I did a lot of backpacking. We hiked the Pacific Crest Trail and the Continental Divide, and we always did it as a fundraiser for people with disabilities or some kind of purpose to keep us focused on the journey. And uh, the media called us Mugs and Joe. And my sister was Joanne, and I was Marion, and we became Mugs and Joe. And it almost became like a real spiritual name to me because that's where my strength came from living out in the wilderness for such a long period of time. I was a shy person. I'm under five feet tall and, and it just gave me my strength. So it, uh, yeah, it stuck. (laughs) Well, it's great. I love saying it mugs. (laughs) It's a very cool name and um, it's a pleasure to get to speak with you. I remember Oh, when your book came out, it was in like, was it 2016? It wasn't that long ago. It seems like forever now with everything, but was it 2016? Is that right? It does seem like a very, very, very long time ago, but it's, yeah, it was actually, yep, 2016, right on. (laughs) Wow. Well, for anybody listening, the book was called Letters, or is called Letters from the Yoga Masters, and really... It's an incredible collection of letters that you obtained, and maybe we can talk some about how that happened. But I I have to say, like, when I was thinking about people to talk to, you know, sort of the pandemic had really sort of overridden things. And then now that it's been some months, I was looking back over things and seeing, wow, you know, we've been really 
sort of tracking this evolution of yoga. And I had people on, you know, we had, I know one of your teachers, Eric Schiffman on, and you know, he talked about lighting, writing a letter to Desika Char, you know, and getting a letter back from Desika Char and how, you know, there was a time and you know it better than I do when there weren't just these group yoga classes everywhere. And you would like send letters <laughs> to, to these gurus in India and they would often write you back. Um, yeah, and I guess, times. what's that? Very different time. Yeah. And then even, you know, even if I take it like another generation after that, even so my generation, let's say those folks who wrote the letters like Eric and, you know, some of the teachers in New York that I met who went to India ultimately and met these gurus and came back and then opened up their storefronts and had altars with their pictures of their gurus on them, you know? And for me at that time, like, and I say this all the time on this show, people have heard me say it a million times, you know, there wasn't these teacher trainings. So the way that you, you became a teacher was you just showed up enough and consistently enough for like a year or two. And then you would kind of get a nod. The teacher would go out of town and need you to cover. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Yeah. And so there was a little bit of still that, like, I don't know, this relationship to teacher and it wasn't gurus. Like these weren't gurus to me. They never presented themselves as a guru to me, but this is a little bit of a long winded just introduction to why I wanted to speak to you because it seemed to me that you had a foot in a time and then you did some documenting of this letter writing and of these gurus who quite frankly, even since 2016, like all of these figures who, when I came into yoga in 1993, were like considered these revered authority guru masters. Now here in 2020, all of them, like they all have fallen from grace. And it, it's such a drastic paradigm shift, you know? Yes. Yeah. So sp- speaking to someone like you is a way for me to try to make sense of it, you know, to hear from someone who, had more direct experience of the times when before the shift and to sort of help us sort of, I don't know, figure out where to put these gurus and, and, and now that we know what we know about them and stuff. So thank you. All that's just to say welcome and thank you and let everybody know, you know, what, what initiates this conversation and to help sort of tee it off for you. I know that this book was, really um, through one of your teachers. His name is what? Dr. Hari. Is that right? Yes. Dr. Hari Dickman from Latvia. So I know you've spoken about it some before, but maybe you don't mind doing it again for me and listeners here. Can you say a little bit about Dr. Hari and who he was and maybe how you met him? Yes. You know, it blends of course, right into what you are talking about back in the, 70s I really wanted to learn how to meditate I didn't even really know what yoga asanas were uh it was the meditation that I was very interested in and I, you know it was inspired from the Beatles going to India and learning how to meditate and you know the uh inspiration came from that curiosity but I didn't know where to go. Like, where do you go? And at the time, there was Maharishi Mahesh Yogi giving out mantras, you know, for a fee. And I was just a poor university student. Well, before that, I was a high school student. So I I couldn't find a, a way to connect in the small town where I was. There was no way to find a preceptor and all of those things. Uh, but the curiosity, you know, once the seed is planted and you start seeking, you're guided to, um, you know, things begin to unfold for you. So um, excuse when me I, for a minute, oh, let me ask, yes. what, were you, what were you studying when you were in school and interested in meditation? I was going to university to be a social worker. Okay. I, I never ended up as a social worker, though. <laughs> that makes sense. You, you know, I mean, I could, 
I've had a fair amount of social worker and nurses come through my teacher training programs over the years. Like there's a, there's a Mary there. So okay, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm just curious. So like, were you inclined to that kind of, were you like hippie or something in your college years? Were you more hippie minded? Cause you said you came from a very rural place. Yeah, I was more hippie minded and, uh, you know, kind of like earthy loved, um, just loved the wilderness and nature and uh, great music. And the Beatles really inspired me with how they evolved over time, you know, from <laughs> how they were rock and roll and then became these incredibly insightful writers of, of deep meaning and how George Harrison's music transformed to incorporate mantras. And I didn't really understand it all. And then, uh, Ram Das's book, Be Here Now, really touched me, and I was just trying to grasp the concepts, but <laughs> yeah. they were very much above my head. So uh, what when I was in university, I realized this isn't really what I want to do. What I want to do is be a yoga teacher, but I don't even know how to do that because there's nobody training you to be yoga teachers. And through university, I developed very severe sciatica from sitting so much time in the classrooms. And also I had been a gymnast and probably had some misproportions in my body from my great love of back bends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, it was recommended by the doctors that I take a year off. And so in that year off, I went to Australia and discovered the international yoga teachers association there, which uh, in the, recently celebrated its 50th anniversary so a very long-standing yoga association and they're the ones that ultimately directed me to Hari I, I couldn't do the training over in Australia uh, because of the fact that it was like one weekend a month and so they suggested one of their teachers from England suggested that I write a letter to Hari and ask if he would be my teacher because at that point in time, he was living in Southern California. Hmm. Yeah. So I wrote him a letter and asked him if he would be my teacher. And he said, no. <laughs> so, so how does that letter go? It's like, hi, my name is Muggs and I'm looking for a yoga teacher. Will you be my teacher? I've just, see, that's so like nobody to, in this time knows what, like that's how you got a teacher. I always start all these workshops I do with people by asking anybody if they've ever had like a teacher who was like a one-to-one -one teacher to them. And almost no one ever raised their hands. Everybody came to yoga in these group classes. <laughs> but this idea that you had to write your teacher at home and ask him and then he first said no, that's like a very, like that's what I'm talking about. So you wrote him and what, do you remember what the letter said? <laughs> well, not precisely, but you know that's pretty much it. I, I yeah. said I'm very interested in yoga. I, I the only thing in university that I had been exposed to was um, the occasional yoga class, but the teachers were rather inexperienced at the time. I didn't realize that Swami Gita Nanda was actually teaching in Vancouver when I was in university, but I wasn't. Uh, I didn't know that. Mm. And I did go get my transcendental meditation mantra by that time. So this was a couple of years later. And uh, I, so I really didn't have a lot of exposure. And so when I wrote him, I said, I'm really interested in this. This is what I know. Uh, and really, I was such a novice. It's not surprising that he said no, but it was a conditional no. Like he said, I'm too old, like I'm 80, so I don't really want to take on a new disciple or student, but you can write me letters and ask me all the questions that you want. And so that was the beginning of our discourse. He needed to get to know me. I needed to get to know him. And so we were really rather con constant in our writing letters. And there was a condition in it in that he asked me <laughs> when I wrote him if I would send him really good chocolate. <laughs> yeah, so that was that was part of what I did. I would buy him very lovely uh, Souchard chocolate, which was quite accessible in Latvia for him. And he missed it a lot. And um 
And he explained to me that chocolate was a bit of a, 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 a ritual. It was a ceremony. When he received one of these letters or a book from the yoga masters that he would write, he would sit down with a, a piece of chocolate and this letter and just savor the flavors of both. And it was a really, really special ritual for him. He just enjoyed it so much. See, like communications were so much more, I don't know, sacred, but we didn't have like before the internet. I've often said there was yoga before the internet and yoga after the internet. Cause <laughs> you know, there was that, that was the way you, I, I haven't, when's the last time you wrote a handwritten letter to anybody? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So you, I also love that it was about, you have to ask questions. Eric talked about that too, about how like Desika Char for like a long time didn't teach him anything and he wondered why. And then he figured it out that he had to ask questions. And then if you ask questions, then Desika Char would teach him stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And they're indicators of your, as Eric would say, your current state of ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, I like that. It's a good way to put it. Although we could probably be more, we could say your current state of wisdom. You know what I mean? You're just the same. <laughs> it's exactly the same. They mean the same thing yes, so much. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, okay. So you just started writing in these letters full of questions? That's right. I would start writing and you know, really, I knew so little that it was very hard to ask questions. So that's one of the beautiful things of yoga is the more you study it, the more questions you have. And because I had really no exposure to a teacher, my questions were very limited. So he would start feeding me thought-provoking information in the letters that then I could ask more questions about them. And uh, eventually... He said, you sound like you're a Hatha yogi, and perhaps what you could do is go and study under two different people. And off the top of my head, I can't remember who one of them was, but the other one was Swami Vishnu Devananda. And so I, uh, the re- he wasn't putting me off to go study them and not communicate with them. It was just that he said, okay, here's here's a way to get going on this. And the, the two swamis were both out of Canada. And so I looked at the, I wrote letters because you couldn't just look it up. I started writing letters. He gave me the contact information of these two people. And it still awes me to this day how he had all this information through letters, how he found all these amazing teachers who taught him. Uh, so I wrote Swami Vishnu's location and I wrote the other one and it just worked out that I could go and take the teacher training in the Bahamas fairly soon. Like I could save up my money and get there and do that the easiest. So that's where I ended up going. And when was that? That was in 1978. Okay. (laughs) So they did have a teacher training in 1978. Mm-hmm. They did. I just didn't know about it yeah. until Hari directed me there. So when uh, I think Swami Vishnu set up his teacher trainings in the late 60s and um, Gunga White, I know, was one of his. It was in the earlier training. So this was, you know, he was probably in the 10 years of having had it at the time. The and teacher. forgive me, I've had initial ad- Devi on a few times and wasn't she involved in that organization too or was that different you no know, she could have been I don't really know yeah. um, everyone who is involved in it for sure but yeah. she probably could have been for sure okay so you went to go study Hatha Yoga with Swami Vishnu Devananda what was that like uh, well, it was, uh, it's, <laughs> it's funny because as I say, Hari and I continued to write letters. And so he kind of gave me a little bit of uh, preparation in advance and said, you know, he can, he can be, they were guru bhais. And by guru bhais, I mean, they were brothers under the same guru. So Swami Shivananda was the guru and uh, Hari, even though he never met Swami Shivananda, he wrote letters and 
uh, with all of the other disciples at that time, like Venkatesananda and Satchidananda and, uh, you know, Vishnu Devananda. So they were Guru Bhais. And so he, you know, said Swami Vishnu uh, can have a little bit of a temper <laughs> and mm. so be prepared. And, uh, but, you know, so, yeah, it was a different experience for me. I look back in my notes during that time and I absolutely loved the information I was being given. Like it was true classical yoga with all the Sanskrit terminology and all the practices of pranayama and kriyas and, you know, the lectures and uh, regular asana practice. And so it was a very, very well-balanced uh, methodical teacher training and I loved being there and learning so much uh, what I didn't like <laughs> was <clears throat> being yelled at <laughs> and I know sometimes um, it's it's considered you know the part of the discipline to keep you on track and to kill your ego or whatever but I you know I don't respond well to that kind of learning um to uh you know to be spoken harshly to and it didn't happen very much to me but you know I it was still there was certainly like a deference to these figures where like those kinds of warnings about I've heard them from other people when they were and and it's problematic in other ways <laughs> when you, you know, when we, it was, well, I'm, what I'm trying to say is at that time, nobody was questioning that behavior in the way we do today. That's correct. That's absolutely correct. I mean, discipline was in a whole different realm. And I can just imagine uh, being uh, a yoga master and having all these students coming of all walks of life and not really knowing what they're walking into. And it is a very, very disciplined time of getting up at the wee hours of the morning and going to bed late at night. And just your entire focus is yoga. And I'm sure that at times you get impatient um, based on that. But, but yes, I, I mean, I, I have to stop for a second because just now when you said that, it's very interesting to me because you just described like that, what would we call it? the sadhana, right? The tapas of getting up early in the morning and doing all the bhakti. And then, you know, and some, I, some people write about that now as essentially grooming techniques, depriving you of sleep and exhausting you and filling your head with these things to make you devoted to the guru. Did you feel like that? Did you, did, did you consider Swami Vishnu Devananda to be a guru to you? Well, I didn't feel like that was deprivation by any stretch of the imagination uh, at all. I completely understand it through the, the studies that it's called intense sadhana at the time. And it's like a booster shot where mm. you remove yourself from the day-to-day uh, disturbances and distractions and completely devote yourself to the yoga practices so it's part of the tapas, the part of the discipline of the um, eight limbs of yoga. And it, it was a discipline. There wasn't time for exterior distractions. And so I valued that very, very much. But it shouldn't be a full-time thing. So if I was a, a worker in the ashram, right, somebody who had decided to stay on and live there, then you know, there needs to be a sense of normalcy and a sharing of the duties so you have a normal life because intense sadhana is intended for a short period of time, not your entire life. And it's not a, intended to be a life of uh, intense karma yoga, <laughs> like I've read about, you know, where they, it's just overwork and they've lost their ability to do any of their other practice besides karma yoga to serve the ashram so this was really presented to you as just like a temporary measure you weren't it wasn't presented to you as like this could be your lifestyle exactly yes this was just intense sadhana for the purpose of 
a, a big booster and then, you know, off you go with it. <laughs> okay. So you're in like your twenties, right? Yes. Yeah. I was 22. Okay. And so you're at the ashram and how long did you spend there? I spent uh, two months in the ashram, all under the training of the what we would call today the 200 and the 300 hour for a 500 hour certification. But at the time, it, of course, it was way more hours than that <laughs> and uh, not, not classified because Yoga Alliance didn't exist. Uh, so then I still didn't feel ready to teach. So I decided to stay with the organization for three more months and um, just, you know, gather more experience. So the first place I was moved to was uh, the San Francisco Center. And uh, beautifully, because Hari lived in San Rafael, and we could begin communicating in this new level of communication because now I had the language I had learned the terminology and it just completely shifted where our conversations were going. So that was really wonderful that we were closer together. Mm. Now, when you say they, they moved you, what does that mean? Like you were in community and they decided to have you go stay somewhere else or did you get to decide that? Uh, No, I didn't get to decide that. Um, I had actually wanted to go to Montreal because I wanted to learn more French. I wanted to be immersed in French. But when when I said, okay, I would like to stay home with the organization, they essentially send you where they need help, where they're short of help. And so uh, San Francisco was the first one on the list. And so that's where I went. And then from there, I was sent to Hollywood to teach in the center there. And then from there, I was sent to Montreal. Did you, did you meet Leslie Kamenoff in Hollywood? I don't know when he was there. He, was, he ran that place for a little while in Hollywood, if I'm not mistaken. That oh, is that right? You, uh, <laughs> I, I definitely could have, as I say, <laughs> so long ago. And even during that time, uh, there was the shift. I was devoting myself to the organization. And, um, you know, there was a number of us living there. And there was one woman who was my key person who was saying, okay, we're going to go to the spa here and we'll teach yoga at the spa. And then we'll teach here in the, in the living room for the people who come in. And she was sort of my mentor to line me up where I was going to teach the classes. So, uh, yeah, I was in Hollywood at the center there for one month and communicating again, regularly with Hari. Now I was able to, uh, still write him letters and phone him. And then once uh, I got to go up to Grass Valley and I was able to stop and have another little visit with him. So we had little opportunities to visit in person, which was lovely. I'm sorry, did you did you like take vows and wear robes? Uh, no, no. Yeah. I knew that was not in the cards for me. I had absolutely no intention of becoming celibate (laughs) (laughs) okay and so do you remember the first time you actually got to meet dr hari in person yes actually when i decided to go to the ashram uh back in the 70s our greyhound buses and trailways buses had one-way bus passes anywhere you wanted to go for 50 bucks (laughs) and uh so i bought a one-way bus passed from British Columbia to Florida, to Miami. And on the way, I stopped in in San Rafael and visited Hari. And that's where we met in person. And we connected so deeply, so instantly. Here I was, this 22-year-old, and I have a picture of me and him in in my book. And, you know, (laughs) it's just... um, just so so fun to meet him and we were so joyful to meet and he showed me some pranayama techniques and we just had these beautiful conversations and then I got on the bus and away I went but that was the first time we actually met in person Hmm. and you know I've heard you speak about him 
in the the M and M's on your altar to honor the chocolate prasad, which I love the idea that prasad <laughs> doesn't have to be nuts; <laughs> it can be M and M's. Do you? And he's clearly, and then we'll we'll get to the letters. He he really. Do you think of Dr. Hari as a guru of yours? Your guru? You know, I I do, but uh, here's the thing. <laughs> When I was actually studying with him in person, um, I asked him if he would be my guru, and his words have never left me. It was so profound. Uh, He said, oh, no, that's way too much responsibility. I will be your teacher, but I will not be your guru. And that, you know, what Ham was, when I was living in the ashram, uh, it somewhere the seed in my mind got planted that if I wanted to be successful, I needed to become a guru. So I started in my mind aspiring that uh, that would be my ultimate objective to be a guru. And really, fortunately for me, um, Hari just reset that. And here's this you know, by that time he was 84 years old when I was studying with him in person. And he, he clearly was completely respected in India by so many different masters of pathways. And yet he said, no, oh, that's too much responsibility. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Very humbling. Very, very humbling. And well, really I always, said, I always say we like the, our teachers are models in a sense, you know, they model certain things. So he very clearly modeled for you, hey, no, I don't want to put myself in that position with you. And that's an interesting model to have in your experience, especially from someone like you said, who he did have all these correspondences. So tell me, tell me something about him and like, what was his story with this person from Latvia who had all these correspondences with these gurus? How did that happen? Uh, yes, well... Here he was in Latvia and uh, before the Second World War, and he told me that he started uh, studying yoga at the age of 14, and he died at the age of 84, so his entire life was devoted to yoga. So in the late 1920s, he started the Latvian Yoga Society. At the time, it was more of a like a Theosophical Society group, but in the early 30s, it became the Latvian Yoga Society. And he. Wait a second, I need to take that in for a second. In the 1930s, there was a Latvian Yoga Society. Yes. I I just need to say that out loud again. I've never heard that before, but that's crazy. I had someone on from Serbia who talked about like the early roots of yoga in Serbia too. And just, it's interesting to hear that. There was in the 1930s a Latvian Yoga. (laughs) Thing. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And uh, the right now, as we speak, Latvia is uh, doing a documentary of the history of yoga in Latvia. And they invited me over there to mm. um, be a part of it because Hari was such a, uh, a foundation in that society and sharing these teachings of yoga. So um, he. If you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J. Brown Yoga Talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.